That is the biggest lie in the world. And if you believe that, you will fail. Welcome to the LabVIEW experiment. I am your host, Sam Taggart from SAS Workshops. In my 15 years of working with and training developers, I've had the opportunity to conduct a lot of experiments. Over here, we believe in embracing failure as the essential learning experience that it is. And what better way to learn than from other people's mistakes? In this podcast, I talk to industry experts, colleagues, and friends about their failures and how they have turned them into future successes. This episode of the LabVIEW Experiment is brought to you by Zaya Solutions. So I am here today for this episode with John Wu of Tenet Technologies and also NI Parts Direct, which we'll talk about a little bit. <laughs> um, John is in Taiwan at the moment. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I should mention he was a sponsor of GDF Con and A, even though he couldn't make it. So we very much appreciate that. Yeah, that was the year of COVID, huh? yeah. unfortunately. Um, yeah, so why don't you start? Uh, you wanted to talk about uh, NI and LabVIEW in the rest of the world, because I feel like our podcast yep. is mostly centered around the United States and Europe, and that's where a lot of our listeners are. Although I think we probably have a, fa a fan base in India, too. Yeah. There seems to be a very avid yeah. uh, Indian uh, community. <laughs> and then I did a, uh, I did an interview with Ram a while ago, and I spoke at some virtually at some conference in India, and so I gained a whole bunch uh... of but, yeah, uh, there, there are a lot of levy users in India. Yeah, it's actually remarkable. There's probably more than anywhere else. But yeah, <laughs> just by the 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 ratio of population, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I guess I could start with that because um, honestly, my journey with LabVIEW has been very uh, interesting. Um, I, I started in um, uh, we were exposed to it in college, so I went to Tufts University out in um, Boston or Medford, Massachusetts, uh, back in the day. This was like 20, 30 years ago. Um, we had this course that used RoboLab. Uh, and if you, if you haven't heard of RoboLab, it was a collaboration between uh, Lego, MIT, Tufts, and NI. Is that like so, a precursor to the Mindstorms thing? Exactly. So okay. if, you, if you look it up, it's called Lego RCX, the hardware. So it's kind of like a brick, uh, yellow brick. Um, it was the, the, the predecessor of the NXT. So what we had to do, there was a prof professor in, out in Tufts, um, Chris Rogers, he, he's awesome. Um, and he had, he had, had, he had us make, make um, robot um, uh, projects based on that Lego kit. And then lo and behold, the software, it, um, and I and Tufts and MIT, they made this kind of a skin, or uh, an interface based on LabVIEW uh, for that Lego controller. So uh, in other words, you, you could have, have like forks and loops, um, VIs, um, you know, make it beep, make it walk, make it do different things. So that, that was my exposure to LabVIEW. But now, so after, after Tufts, after I graduated there, um, um, I was looking for a job. Well, first of all, I returned to, to Taiwan uh, just for personal reasons. I, I thought, hey, might as well, you know, um, uh, try out a different environment. And, and because I spoke Chinese, little Ch Chinese at the time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, so I was looking for a Do job. I, are you originally then from the U.S.? Or were you originally? No, no, no. So I'm originally from, from Taiwan. Okay, that's uh, what I thought. Yeah, okay. The way you said that, it, it wasn't clear. So yeah, so you're originally from yeah. Taiwan. Originally from class. Taiwan, but so there's a side story. So I spent 10 years of my life in Saudi Arabia. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's a that's a different. That's, that's interesting. A, that's that's, a, that's a, different several story. different cultures. I would yeah. imagine. Yeah, and and that actually I can I could speak to because, um, well, one thing at a time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I, so I came back to Taiwan, I was looking for a job, and I was like, hey, uh, I remember that thing called LabVIEW, it was kind of, kind of fun. And oh, wait, there's that National Instruments, what, they're, what, the, what are they doing in Taiwan? So they had this office there, and, and so I interviewed, uh, long story short, I, I got in uh, and I started as an application engineer, um, and LabVIEW felt natural to me. Um, that's, that, that not only because of its graphical nature, but also what I, what I found about learning LabVIEW for the first time as an English speaker was that there are tons of documentation. 
you know, you had the control age context help, you had the um, the uh, manuals, you had the if if you had access to the uh, to the course material written mm -hmm. by NI, that was great. That was like if you were an internal person or ex external person, you go through that course, boom, you kind of got a good idea of how to use LabVIEW. Now, here's the tricky thing. So when I started as an application engineer, my job was to support customers, right? Well, mm -hmm. in my local country, people don't speak English that well, okay? Mm -hmm. And so it, when, when it was my job to help them out when they had LabVIEW problems, and most of the LabVIEW problems were so elementary as in, how do I do a for loop? How do I do a while loop? Is there a YouTube, well, YouTube wasn't big at the time. So is there a YouTube video that I can look at? Is there a tutorial that can, that I can read in Chinese? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, so it was like, for me, it was like, what, what why are you asking these elementary questions, rudimentary questions where it, to me, it was like, boom, 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 boom. But doesn't this just make sense? So, so then, I have a related question. So, so uh, I, a while ago, I speak Spanish and a while ago I gave a presentation to the Latin American user group and I was all worried because like, I didn't know the words for certain things. And it turned right. out it was all Spanglish because like <laughs> half the words were like the same, the English word, because they just either right. didn't ever bother to translate it or whatever. And exactly. so actually a lot easier than I thought because I thought I was going to have to learn all these esoteric words that I didn't know. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. So, so for engineers, it, it's a little different because if you, let's say if you studied engineering in, uh, in Chinese or Japanese mm -hmm. or Korean, right. Um, there'll be some terms that are just commonly English known, you know, like volts, power, blah, blah. Okay. So those don't translate. Right. It's just volts. Yeah. So okay. because you've been exposed to them in your curriculum at some point, you mm -hmm. know that, okay, I know the Chinese word for volts. And I know also at the same time, the English word for volts, you know, because yep. you use it so, so commonly. Uh, but for LabVIEW, it's like shift register. Yep. Or um, uh, what's it called? Ah, here's a good one. So the Huai loop, the, the, the little thingy on the right hand, right bottom corner. Iteration the, the terminal or the stop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whichever the iteration terminal or the stop condition. It's like, how do you translate? How do you say that in, in Chinese? We just say really the little red thing on the right hand bottom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hope they don't and, move it around. <laughs> exactly. It, and, and so, yeah. um, uh, 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 and like half a year into the job, a colleague said to me, he, he said that, hey, you know, and, and I was young at the time and I was kind of like being an asshole. Um, and he's like, you really should t um, empathize with the customer because they don't know English as well as you do. And you really should chill out because you, you think that they, re they, they ask elementary questions. But it, it, in reality, it's not elementary to them because there's been a language gap and then another LabVIEW gap. You know, so, so that begs a question. Would it be better to try to teach them English so they can then teach themselves LabVIEW rather than yeah, try to teach exactly. them? Exactly. So, 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 so then my boss came to me, he's like, well, now that you realize that there's, there's, there's this gap and that gap, can you do something, you know, can you start an initiative like within a company or within our branch? To, to at least address one of these gaps. And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, let's get these tutorials out, localize them in local language, either in Chinese, Japanese, or Korean, or, or whatever. And we find that the acceptance of Lavi was much more higher because we had actually documentation that catered to the customer and then didn't, didn't force them by hand to say, you must learn Lavi before you learn Lab, uh, you must learn English before you learn Lavi. So, yeah. so I have an interesting question then. Did you do any studies? I'm curious how things like MATLAB and stuff localize. Mm. I'm also curious how like regular okay. programming languages localize, like Python or something, right? All the keywords yeah. have to be in English, right? Okay, so get this. In order for that to happen, you have to have enough textbooks in local language. So MATLAB, it has been the de facto, or at least in Taiwan, it has been kind of the de facto engineering language uh, since 
30 years ago. So professors, they, they come up with, you know, this book, uh, How to Write MATLAB, first edition in Chinese, and then they go into second edition, third edition, and then uh, a, a, you know, that professor will have that book, that professor will have that book. You, when you have these textbooks, plus people in schools teaching MATLAB, and then plus the company or the distributor behind MATLAB um, uh, having events, having you know marketing activities, and so forth. That could, that 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 flywheel just kind of rolled, right? Okay. Um, but in the beginning, you know, LabVIEW was new thirty years ago to my country in in Taiwan. So mm -hmm. that flywheel did not was not turning yet. Mm -hmm. And so internally, we we saw that, and so we said because our branch, it being a sales sales branch. Uh, we saw that um, if you wanted to sell more, that flywheel has to kick in. And so we did a lot of academic outreach and saying to this, this teacher, that professor saying, hey, would you write this book for us? Would you write that book for us? Would you write that book for us? Uh, would you teach, that, teach this course in, in, uh, in um, electrical engineering? Would you teach this course based on LabVIEW uh, for that engineering and so forth? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and I'll give you another example. If you ask anyone from the Japan branch or use LabVIEW in Japan, they've had it really, really hard. But NI in Austin, they saw uh, the language gap. So let, let me back up a bit. If you, if you, if you, if you, if you learn engineering in Japan, um, it's a well-known fact that most Japanese people, and, and I don't say this with generalization, um, the English level of most Japanese engineers is not that profession, okay? And so you can imagine the language gap that I just mentioned. If you don't know English, how do you learn LabVIEW? In Japan, it's almost like you're, you're climbing, you're, you're, the, the headwinds are, are stronger. You're climbing, you're trying to climb a, a higher mountain. So, and I internally, they had a big effort in localizing everything, even the LabVIEW. So there's LabVIEW for LabVIEW in Japanese. Uh -huh. The the only localized languages for LabVIEW are simplified Chinese, Japanese, and I believe I could look it up really quick French, on Google. Maybe? Is French? Yeah, French. There's Spanish. a handful. German. Okay. Yeah, but there's a, there's a there's only a small handful. Yeah. Exactly. Not over five. Not over five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, if your country or if your locale was not of one of these five local uh, versions of LabVIEW, you're screwed. Yeah, that yeah. Means, <laughs> you only you could only learn through through English. You know, Japan was luckily luckily enough one of the locales that and I identified um, yeah. a long time ago to say, hey, we want to get into Japan. So therefore, everything that we have, documentation, interface, everything has to be in Japanese for these people to 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 get it and mm -hmm. use it and so that that was the story for japan however for taiwan there was one there was simplified chinese which is kind of catered to the mainland china um but in taiwan the simplified chinese doesn't really connect well, so so question when you say chinese though and i i, mm. I am completely ignorant about this but my understanding <laughs> is chinese right because there's Aren't yeah. there at least two different dialects, like major exactly. dialects, and then probably right. a bunch of other smaller right. ones? Okay. So in, in written Chinese, there's really uh, two types. There's simplified, and then there's traditional. Okay. So the simplified, um, mainline China uses mainly simplified Chinese. Uh, the traditional Chinese mainly is for Taiwan. So that's the main difference. Now, you would think that they would be kind of mutually compatible, but when actually it's it's not it takes a lot of effort to to get used to if if you if you were born uh if you if you learn um traditional as a kid you you'll have to put in a lot of effort to to learn simplified and vice versa okay yeah so that's that's the background of the of the language gap but in in any case so locally, we did a lot, a lot of effort. Either we localized data sheets, you know, spec sheets, manuals, uh, YouTube um, videos, and so forth. So after a year of being an applications engineer, I moved into marketing, 
And so that was when uh, we really turned up the heat in, in saying, okay, we're a, we're a foreign company trying to, trying to, to bring this foreign product to the local market. What can we do locally to make this more easier to consume by our local customers? And that was our whole 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 vision behind that. Do, do you run into any like uh, any uh, problems with like uh, translating words and stuff? Like I remember yes. like the, the classic yes. example is the Chevy Nova, right? Mm. In Spanish, Nova means doesn't go, right? Oh like, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, like nobody bought it because they're like, why would I buy a car that doesn't go? Right, 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 right. right, 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 right. In English, it just means Nova is like, you know, it's like a non-word. Okay. Like a supernova. Or <laughs> so I, I don't have any examples of that off the top of my head, but it, it's not like, you know, love you means kill yourself in, in Chinese. Or yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> if there were any, you know, so a part of my job was to, let's say if I was translating something that uh, corporate Austin had put out, you know, either a data sheet or, or a press release or, or something, you know, um, we had, so in marketing, we had the marketing engineers who were kind of like the engineers um thrown into the marketing department and then we had the marketing communications people who who have who do the press releases you know events and so forth and so on so they would come to the, come to us and say what is this this word what is dr t trying to express graphical system design how do we translate that into chinese you know and i'd be like well we, you didn't have google translate at the time and you certainly didn't have chat gpt yeah so we were like, well, we're just going to pick this and stick with it. And they were like, okay, cool. And then, and then they said to me, every time you get on stage or you, every time you do a seminar, we're just going to unify and in Taiwan use this word as the Chinese definition of graphical system design or of virtual <laughs> instrumentation, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, slogan that corporate had at the time. Yeah um and, and that was fun now that, that was like let's try to guess what dr t was thinking hmm if i was an old man with white hair you know <laughs> and yeah it, it was fun yeah well and also too there's like cultural like sometimes like just the cultural differences aside from the language to make things harder right yeah. right yeah and so i i guess my 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 takeaway was that hey it's a lot <laughs> If you don't speak English, English it's actually a lot harder to learn Lavio. And so yeah. that's one of the, so if you're in India, if you're in Australia, if you're in um, Europe, I think English comes pretty naturally um, uh, on LinkedIn. And I think I've heard, so I was in Sydney uh, a few weeks ago and I okay. met Nancy and then she, she, she told us about a project, I think kind of like an open source project to um it, it's like a learning lab you yeah steve's uh yeah uh I forget what it's called yeah i think yeah it has an acronym but i forget what it is Commun yeah yeah something you know you get community training initiative that's it uh, CTA. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You, you get a raspberry pi or something and then it loads mm -hmm. up with lab you so yeah you know i think it's great because step one pick one language you know one spoken language english yeah. which happens to be the biggest uh, the, the biggest denominator. Um, uh, but I, I could see that if that initiative takes off and, you know, within five to six years time, they're probably going to have to, to either, either local people like me or people in Japan or people in Korea, they, 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 they join the effort and try to localize it in different yeah. languages or, well, so, yeah. you know, so but, Steve, I talked to Steve recently about that, and that's all open and open mm -hmm. source. So in theory, you should be able to do that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, but, it will know, take energy, energy and effort, but yes. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and no, I don't know who's going to put that energy and effort in, but somebody maybe. Yeah, but so here's the thing: I find really, really so the 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 story doesn't end. It surprised my ass off to know that there are actually, you know, LaVue experts in Taiwan or in China or in these, you know, countries that don't speak English. And I'm, I, I'm puzzled all the time at, okay, how were they able to get across that initial language gap of English 
Mm -hmm. And then once you get to a point of things just clicking and, and you kind of see the matrix, you kind of see through the matrix and then boom, boom, off they go. They're talking about, you know, uh, QMH, DQMH, Active Framework. So do those people uh, then that. just, they don't know English at all and somehow they still manage to become experts? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm yeah. You know, so there's like a clone of Sam Taggart in, in, in Taiwan. There's like a clone of, you know, these live view experts in, 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 in different countries. And it, it's interesting to me because I see people on LinkedIn, on YouTube and, and, and things like that. There's actually, yeah, <laughs> believe it or not, there's a, you could, you could, you could actually say there's probably like an evil counterpart to you in, in each individual country. <laughs> where he like replicated himself. <laughs> yeah, and it's like people. So, so when I went to Sydney, it was really interesting because um, uh, for GDEFCON in ANZ, um, you had presentations such as, "Hey, um, this is the uh, the framework. You know, either it's DQ image or or some sort of version variation of an in-house." Uh, a test structure, if mm -hmm. you will, you know, like Kurt Friday, he has his Viper and so yep. forth. Um, yeah, it and but when I went to Sydney, I was like, huh, I have heard this story before because there are actually people in Taiwan who, you know, if they're if they're integration houses like system integrators or consultants mm -hmm. or what have you, everybody in house has some sort of flavor of you know their go to uh, uh, framework when they get a bid or they get a project, they say, okay, well, this fits it, you know, 90%, boom, and I'll tweak it to make it work, right? And, and, and it was and very interesting to me when, you know, I haven't had the chance to go out to uh, uh, Colorado or, or whatnot, but as long as you're using LabVIEW, you have the same problems. You mm -hmm. talk about the same, same issues, you know, and you talk about the same bugs and 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 it it transcends the gap of spoken language <laughs> i was about to ask though yeah are there like cultural differences though like if you look at two different cultures and the way they write code do they do they think slightly differently and do they make different assumptions and then do you find different bugs because uh, be you know how do you do honestly that's a that's a that's a really big question that's a big question that's a that's a question beyond the scope of my understanding because yeah. um not only is it a a cultural difference it's also a difference in the way software engineering is taught oh yeah and the way mathematics is taught too because i've heard exactly. like countries teach mathematics very differently than we teach it in the u.s mm. yeah and it, and it, and all you know I've heard, I've seen a lot of episodes on podcasts on on the Lavio experiment, mm -hmm. where you know experts are saying, "Hey, companies in U.S. should really buy into more values of software engineering." Or I think I forget who who it was, but it said somebody said, "You know, uh, companies should really um, value software engineering more," or, or something like that. Why? That that that's the first question that claps into my mind, right? Like it's easy right. to value this, but but you've got, it's almost like, yes, they should value it, but you got to sell it, right? So right, 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 right. You can't exactly. tell them what's in it for them. Why, like, you should value math more. Okay, great. But like, what's... <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, it becomes, um, it's like the, the way you were taught good manners. Mm -hmm. If, 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 let's say you went to a country and um, it's not good manners to shake hands when, when you meet someone. Yeah. When you grow up, when you go to different countries, you you naturally tend not to shake hands. But if you go to you know Australia or U.S. or or, or the you're West, it's kind of rude. You shake hands, you know, and people are like, "Hey, how are you?" And then you're like, "Um." Are you or you go to Latin America or uh, at Italy, where like you know you greet people by kissing them on the cheek or something? Right. Like American. Like, yeah, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, another great cultural thing. When I I spent some time in Mexico in college, and when I went down there, they explained to me that like in, in Mexico. If somebody asks you a question, you don't answer. You don't have an answer. It's like considered rude. So like ah. they warned us, like if you would ask people for directions on the street, they would give okay. you directions, even if they didn't know where you were going. Because be I rude. think it's that way. I don't know. <laughs> and right? you end up getting and, lost. Yeah. So so there's like, but there's like lots of little weird things like that coming from one culture to another that are like, right. yeah, right. So you know, you take that 
bundle of joy, you know, and, and then you, 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 tri you, you look at the software engineering aspect. So me, I studied mechanical engineering in school, so I have no software engineering background other than mm -hmm. what was taught to me by NI. Um, so if, if you take that into perspective of how people code around the world, you know, let's say just I have no idea about how Japanese people code. Let's say if they're very strict about um, uh, dotting their I's, crossing their T's and having yeah. comments and so forth. Maybe if you sat down and did a code review with a Japanese lab engineer and they were like, oh, all their code is really neat. And, and but, uh, you know, all their documentation is kind of tucked away in some uh, Word document or HTML or, yeah. or, or something. But then if you travel to the other side of the world, let's say if you if you if you sat down with an engineer from, I yeah. don't know, Mexico <laughs> yeah. and asked them, hey, why did you write this code? Well, they really no don't know, but then you know they have to follow your 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 the yeah. the the comment you just made. Uh, 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 well, I don't make up. <laughs> well, I can envision some cultures where like right comments are considered like pedantic, like you know, like yeah, you know, everybody just knows this, so I don't want to say it because then they'll think you know yeah. they'll think yeah, I'm, they'll think I'm, 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 I'm stupid. You know why yeah. am I being redundant? Or vice versa. You know, yeah, yeah. Why am I taking up space with this comment? <laughs> yeah, no, I totally could see cultural values affecting that a lot. So right. that's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's one thing I, I suggest, actually, if you if you travel now that uh, COVID has been lifted, if you travel to different parts of the world, let's say you get invited to a library conference in Korea or whatever, it'd be interesting to to sit down with a library developer and look at their code and see how they do it in Korea. You know, although the, the, the platform, comp, there's a common platform of LabVIEW, but they might use it a little differently and, and, and it's in, interesting to see. Well, I think too, it's like, what are you optimizing for? So like even within yeah. the same cut, uh, I had a conversation with a guy talking about like the different stages of agile and stuff. And like some people are optimizing for like learning. Like I just want to throw something out there and see if it's the right thing and, and be able to change my direction. And other people are like, no, I got to It's got to be right the first time and everything's got to be perfect before oh, I show yeah. it to the customer. Right. Like you get some oh, of that yeah. as well. And that's cultural, even though it's in the same country. Yeah, yeah. I think historically, my experience with, and this isn't the bash on, on um, uh, software engineering in Taiwan. Um, I think. Oh, so this is another issue. Um, LaVue, if if you recall, uh, I recall, it it was. So remember how I said it was natural to me. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the kind of the learning curve was, was really short and, and accelerated. Mm -hmm. um, um, but it's also because of that. Um, you know, now, like, you're, you have awesome content on software engineering, on best practices in LabVIEW. The podcast has great content. You know, people around the world have been putting out really good content. But actually, when when we started um, really promoting LabVIEW 15 or 20 years ago in our local country, um, it was the three icon demo. Yes, the uh, programming is optional slogan, right? That exactly. That was the service right. that I did to any of us. Yeah. And, and that, was, that was a double-edged sword, really, because honestly, from a sales perspective, it felt very natural. It was like, hey, dude, check out this lego box you know and you could do everything with three vis open read or write and close yeah okay. it's great until you want to do something more complicated exactly so customers they bought in they buy this big set of lego bricks <clears throat> they take it home they're like P -p 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 let me build a castle let me build a space you know a yeah. shuttle and, and everything so they build it of course you know we actually so this is another thing let's say if you if you bought LabVIEW in the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, you had access to support engineers from Austin, correct? And if those first line engineers, they, if they didn't know the answer to your question, they had the access to second line engineers, mm -hmm. which were like R&D people. <coughs> and the R&D people, actually, they had access to, you know, probably like the chief developer or the chief engineer. Mm -hmm. And that was a, that, that was actually, you know, the the benefit of uh, another benefit of buying LabVIEW as an English speaker. Now, out in the branch, if you were in uh, 
and I China and I Taiwan and I and Japan and I Korea. So us being the first line sellers or the first line support people, if the customer had a question and we could not solve it or we could not address it, we had to file a um, it was kind of like a ticket. And so somebody mm -hmm. at corporate would escalate um, if if the first line if the first line people in Austin couldn't take care of it, then it would go to the second line and the second line and the third line. So um, it when 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 customers bought in on LabVIEW, and then when they go back and they try to make this you know big space shuttle application, things would fall apart mm -hmm. inevitably, right? Yeah. But but us out in the branches, we were not educated enough to see that things would fall apart. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because most of us, we didn't know what, what the hell we were doing as well. Like we, we could field, how do you use, the, how do you use uh, this VI along with that VI? We could field those questions, but if how you do asked you us- How do you program, yeah. Exactly. If What's you the best us, way to pass data from A to B and like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, unless you were like, a, 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 if you studied LabVIEW in your spare time and you really wanted to climb the ranks, which, by the way, we did not have software engineering uh, positions within NI. It was just like either you were sales or marketing, and that's it. Yeah. You know? So, so then it became, uh, there was this one story where um, we had to rescue a, a application that was a high profile, you know, um, uh, the end customer was Apple. They were pissed, and then they wanted to, to, to firebomb everybody. Like the contract manufacturers, the they wanted to yep. firebomb NI. They wanted to firebomb NI Taiwan. It was a big political mess, um, all based on code that was not rugged. Yep. Um, um, and later on, um, out in our branch, they they opened up positions for system engineers. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 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 So actually, I in 2010 I left NI for a while to yeah. do a kind of a small consultancy, lab consultancy. It was like like a self-employed gig. And I did that for about two or three years, and then they had the system engineering job position, and then they were like, "Dude, this application is falling apart. Would you like to uh, join back NI?" And I was like, "Okay. Well, my wife is having a kid. Uh, I need a more stable source of income." So. And then yep. join back, um, but yeah, like in, in all, in all, re, with all respect, due to love you, you know, if you don't handle it correctly, there are going to be fire bombs yeah. waiting. Well, well, like the biggest common mistake I see, I think, is a company like they're starting out, they're doing R and D, they hire mm -hmm. some guy who's an engineer, doesn't know software engineering. They hand him LabVIEW and a few things and say, hey, here, do some prototype testing, right? And he yeah. tests the prototype and all you're doing is taking a few so, measurements. Okay, it's all good. And they're like, <laughs> great, this thing's awesome. Let's manufacture a thousand a day in our factory and, ah. and let's spread it around five factories and you build the tester because you know how to test this thing. Yeah. Expert because we sent you to one LabVIEW course, exactly. right? Like managing that big giant thing, it's right. a different skill set. It, it reminds Definitely. me there's a book uh, like what got you here won't get you won't there. Won't get you there. Right. Yep. So like all the skills that made you successful in an R and D environment are 100% different from the skills that, and I even struggle with this because exactly. I do a lot of R and D type projects and I'm all about being exactly. agile and stuff, but yeah, like, yeah. you know, if you're doing the agile thing in an R and D environment and you break something, it's generally not a big deal. Right. Like, yeah. but you do that in a production line environment the production line goes down and they miss their, their delivery to Apple or whoever. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you're doing like, destructive testing where you're like you're testing the samples but they actually like you destroy them in the process of testing them right. that that's a whole different ball game yeah yeah i mean so in the context of LabVIEW, i think it without it it's easy to go from zero to one in LabVIEW for mm -hmm. anything you know you slop some code together and there you have it but to go from one to a hundred or even 100 to a thousand that takes knowledge beyond LabVIEW, you know, that takes software engineering skills, that takes architecture, that takes a, you know, good planning. Um, either you use Agile or some sort of, of, of way of mitigating changes and risk. 
Yeah, well, I think um, that even takes it beyond software, though, too, to the point of like integrating with the business, too, right? Yeah, like, exactly, sure, the business goal. actually solves a real business problem, too. It's not just like, <laughs> exactly. oh, I'm writing a bunch of software, right? Exactly. I'm using the software as a tool to solve a business problem, I think, is a much, right. much higher level of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, um, like 90% of the customers who, let's say if you, if you ran a lab shop, you know, and you, you have uh, bids from uh, SpaceX, Tesla, and, and all these customers, right? 90% of the customers, like you do a demo for them, you do a prototype for them and they're like, okay, good. Uh, we'll come back to you in probably a year or two. Let's kick off a, 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 a longer term project uh, because they need time to review it. There's some customers actually out there who, when they see a prototype uh, and the next day they say, I want a thousand of these. They're like, great, it works. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that being, you know, um, the, I don't know how they do things now, but yeah, Apple was one of those companies. Yeah. Nobody yeah. throws away the prototype, right? And exactly. also like, when you built the prototype, you cut a lot of corners because you know, you're under yeah. pressure to get it out. Right. And that's actually totally natural, right? Like in the prototyping stage, you should be throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks. Right. 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 And right. you shouldn't waste your time and, and half of it doesn't stick. So why would you waste your time making the stuff that exactly. doesn't stick but, really fancy? Right. But I, I, I would argue that, you know, you would you would have to manage the expectation of the customer and say, dude, prototype means prototype means inside yeah. shit it is not good. It, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's the business side of it, right? Is like managing the business side is, is moving fast enough to get the stuff out there, but being clear with the customer this is that it's going right. to that's going right. to have to change. Right. right. And so I, I think that's the biggest drop ball that gets dropped because salespeople they say, yeah, the engineers they have a prototype. Oh, you want a thousand of these? Okay, great. I'll I'll, I'll get a. Uh... So is is that a disconnect though between sales and engineering? I think in the sense that Absolutely. like the sales people the sales people. And actually, here's it. Is it a miss? It's a misaligned incentives, right? The salespeople are incentivized to sell as much as possible. So okay. therefore, they don't really care. Like, right? That they're they're not responsible for actually delivering it. Okay. So I would argue, this is actually this this um, depends on the proficiency of the salesperson. And I say this by if if let's say. You know, if let's say if I work for you, let's say if I work for Sam and I'm your salesperson, I'm getting these contracts and bids and, and so forth. Obviously, I want to sell the value. I want to sell the value of uh, SAS. I want to sell the value of our chief, you know, LabVIEW um, programmer. Um, but when I say the proficiency of the salesperson, be, meaning that if I pedal everything and anything to get the order right away without knowing with the potential risks of this prototype being pushed out to the customer without doing you know, enough due diligence, this thing is gonna come and backfire and explode in my face. Well, I think it's a long-term versus a short-term mindset, mm. too, which I think part of the- Exactly. Like designing compensation package, you have to try to take that into account, but like, Right. Is the goal to get the sale today or is the goal to solve the customer's problem? Because if you have the long-term view, yeah. if you actually solve their problem, even if it's not like, if they come to you with a problem, you're like, yeah, I could sell you this thousand dollar thing, or you could go to the hardware store and buy something for five bucks and it'll fix your problem. Right. And you tell them that, yes, you right. lose the thousand dollar sale, but you built right. trust, right? And exactly. trust is valuable. So, so then that would depend on the level of insight that that salesperson has, 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 you know, let's say if you just, if you just graduated and this was your first sales job out of school, you probably don't have the maturity to know that, oh yeah, I, I would, I, I want to be selling, uh, so that the customer gets the most benefit, long-term benefit, you know, mm -hmm. um, either if you're not experienced enough as a salesperson, or if your management has not given you proper training, then usually what happens is, oh, yeah, here's this big shiny thing. Hey, customer, give me your money. Um, see you later. Uh, I don't know where I'm going to be in three to five years. So let's get that order in right now, right away. So I think the, the advice I would give to somebody starting out in sales, and maybe this is wrong, but I, I would just say, like, if you treat people like you would want to be treated, Exactly. If you do that, I think you you it's hard to go wrong, right? So like if, if I could solve my problem with the $5 hardware store versus the $1,000 thing, I would want the salesperson to tell me. 
Well, so so then there's a there's the aspect of ignorance from the salesperson. Let's say if you did not know that uh, that long longer term path was better mm -hmm. and more secure in, in the near future. Let's say you did. Let's say to you in your world in your reality, this five dollar thing is great. Just use it. Yeah. And you sold it because you believed it. Yeah. Then that's 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 the the tricky thing. Yeah, well, yeah, I think part of it is understanding what the end user needs too. And also part of it too is understanding what you're selling, right? Because right. if that thousand dollar part comes with you holding their hand and putting it together and guaranteeing it versus, hey, you spend five bucks and go do it yourself. And right. if it fails, oh, you know, right? So, so sometimes it's actually worth spending the extra money to the customer, right? Because it's right. peace of mind yeah. and that's worth money. But yeah, it's like understanding too, like what they value and how they make decisions and stuff like yeah. that. And it's like, uh, there's a story about a guy who was a construction worker or something. He was working in this right. house and it was a, like this mansion, right? And, <laughs> and the guy's like trying to pick out doors and stuff like that. I go with that one. And it was the right. cheap one because he's like, I wouldn't spend that much money on a door, but you're in a mansion with like marble everywhere and stuff. Yeah. That guy's going to buy the nice fancy door, right? So, so, so one... So, yeah. Yeah. One thing. One thing that came comes to my mind after you said that is um, one of my mentors, one of my teachers, who when I was first starting out in marketing and, and sales, uh, the word value uh, is very contextual. Oh yeah, it's a hundred percent subjective. What's valuable to me is not valuable to somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, you know, we for the what we were talking about, what does the customer value? You know whether they see important or not important um different people will have different reads on that yeah. um and and that's the whole human side of yeah. of sales and marketing right also there's uh, different orders of magnitude too because like when i started working at a company like i was fretting about like spending a hundred dollars on something and my and my bot and my, uh, one of my friends looked at me and he said just add another zero and, and <laughs> right? like like the amount of effort that you would give to decide to spend a hundred bucks is the amount of effort they would give to decide to spend a thousand bucks and vice versa. So it was right. like, I was gonna spend a hundred bucks. It was like spending 10 bucks to the company, right? right? Yeah. And part of that too is like, in those contexts is recognizing your value, right? Like if you're billing a couple hundred dollars an hour to the company, like a $50 expense report should not be a big deal, right? Exactly. Because like, you know, you buy something for 50 bucks, but it saves you an hour of work. Like the company's making out pretty ridiculous. So like, yeah. yeah. Looking to accelerate your projects while ensuring future flexibility? Zaya Solutions team of LabVIEW Architects can help you realize your goals from initial R&D prototyping through full-scale mission-critical deployments. With our extensive experience in test automation and systems integration, whether it's an actor framework program or a real-time distributed system, we'll get you up and running faster than ever. Learn more and check out some of our innovative open source utilities for the LabVIEW community at ZayaSolutions.com. That's Z-Y-A-H Solutions.com. So see, that's a good segue into um, a topic that I, I had in mind was, you know, either it's sales skills for engineers or marketing skills for engineers. Honestly, <laughs> so there's a joke that, that rolls around that says, uh, it, Engineers can build the, the, the best things, you know, rockets, spaceships, um, uh, 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 instruments, what have you. But they want to, when, they, when they start to build a company or start a business, that's a whole different can of worms, you know. Um, the biggest fallacy, and you guys might talk about this in your uh, unconference or in the, I think you have something coming up in December where you're yep. talking about the business aspects. So here's my biggest takeaway of my life, um, like number one fallacy, number one fallacy from engineers or the biggest lie in, in, in the engineering world is that if you build something, people will buy it. If you build it, they will come, right? Like the field, do you know the Field of Dreams movie? Does that bring a yep. bell? Yeah, yep. exactly. If you build it, they will come. No, no, F it's that. Not work no. Any, anybody who does, who thinks that and buys into that. And if you start, start a company by yourself or with founders or with whatever, that is the biggest lie in the world. And if you believe that you will fill, you will fill. <laughs> yeah, no, I, when you started, I, I knew where you were going because yeah, yeah. I've had a conversation with many people. 
Um, and I, I, I learned I, number one biggest thing. Yeah, yeah, I learned this the hard way. I learned this the hard way. You know, you can pour your heart and soul out into building a product, either it's software or hardware. But honestly, businesses exist to serve the customer. Because if you don't serve the customer, you cannot exchange value. You cannot exchange yep. money. Right. So I get I get flack about this comment all the time. And how can you say that? You know, we're craftsmen. We make the best <laughs> watches. You know, we we use the best you know, agile methodology. Great products fail all the time. Beta yeah. Max versus VHS. The what with the, the Blu-ray versus HD DVD. There's right. so many cases of the better product. Yeah, losing. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and and, and uh, it's interesting because within you know the water cooler conversation, if you if you hear two engineers, you know, kind of debate, hey, which is better, you know, Active Framework, QMH, or blah 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 blah. And it's like, which one does a better job of solving the customer's problem? Yeah, exactly. It, like, how, which one's more appropriate for that particular problem that you're solving it, too? And it, it it annoys me so much because in those conversations, nobody is actually representing the customer and saying, well, I think QMH should be more preferable because their application is just a bunch of, you know, kind of uh, 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 trigger this, trigger that, trigger this, trigger that, <coughs> you know, all, all these engineering discussions end up n with no context of the customer's best interests in mind. Yeah. It was like, it's like, no, hey, there, there's you know. zero content. You know what I would love? And I've said this before. I would love somebody to get up at a presentation at a conference and say, here's this great idea I had, and here's where it works, and here's where you should never use it. Right. Nobody ever says that part of it, right? Nobody ever right. acknowledges that, like, there, there's a time and a place for this. And if you don't have this problem, like, it solves a specific problem that right. your customer may have. If you don't have that problem, don't use this. Exactly. Yeah. So... So that's the that's the biggest fallacy, and and, and um, whether it's, whether you're starting out, you know, it doesn't matter if you're getting into if you if you open a um, a bakery shop, <laughs> if if you drive an Uber, if you do any sort of business, if you do not keep the customer's interests in mind, yep. you will not make money. Well, it's also <laughs> it's actually two. Parts. So one is focusing on solving the customer's problem. The second one is actually telling people what you do right because a exactly. lot of years like i don't need to market i do a really good job people should just know okay right? that doesn't happen right you, you still gotta communicate that right so my uh, my biggest takeaway was the biggest lie in the engineering world if you build it they will come that no no that's that's the biggest lie so part two of that the corollary of that my my second takeaway is another mentor had said to me and there's a big takeaway. There was like a sledgehammer that hit me on the head. Don't sell the solution, sell the problem. Ooh. Simmer, take that in. Yeah. Let it, let it simmer for a bit. Don't sell the, the solution, sell the problem. Now, what I mean by that is, and this, is, this, this hit me really big. As engineers, we're really excited about selling the solution. Hey, dude, I've got this, you know, Swiss Army knife. I've got this iPhone. It, it's, it, it's, it's great for this. It's great for that. Blah, 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 blah. But what I mean by selling the problem is that let's first expose how painful this problem is to the customer first. Is it worth solving? It, is, is there actually value in solving this problem? You know? Let's say if you invented, uh, and, and you'll get this all the time, you know, either you're a maker or inventor or, or, or engineer. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a really crude example. My toilet gets stuck all the time, sometimes, okay? Mm -hmm. And a bright inventor, you know, uh, he, <laughs> he comes up with the best um, toilet unplugger. Okay. Or, you know, yeah. it's like building a better mousetrap. It's like, yes, I have a mouse problem, but there's something called a mousetrap that already solves this problem. Now, if you build a better mousetrap, is it, is it worth more? Uh, am, I, am, am, am I constantly 
bugged by these mice that yeah are you uh, wishing you had a better mousetrap right you know and, and, or or the context might be actually no i don't get that many mice and and what i'm doing is working yeah right and you know um, sometimes they'll come and visit me and they'll say hi i'm a mouse and, and, and um you know gnaw on my table for a bit and then go on their merry way so to me you're better mouse catcher yeah it doesn't like you could you could you could you could you could give it to me for free and probably won't even use it yeah uh so this brings so first of all i love this because it goes back to your first point when you're focusing on the problem you're more focused on the customer when you're focusing on the solution you're focused on you exactly and i have to admit i just completely blew this and you just like i had this aha moment so <laughs> so i'm trying to sell this cicd course and, and i think cicd is awesome and i think it's the best thing you but I, I, like, I, you I, haven't I, done I, a good I, enough a job of selling it so i went and i sold the solution i wrote a blog post saying these are the benefit. Th this is the case for CICD, right? Dude. A yeah. better way to do it would be say, you know, Sounds is the problem, problem that, that it takes too long for you to learn stuff about what your customers want because it takes too long to build and it's too error prone and all this stuff. Exactly. What if you solve that exactly. problem? And instead, what I did was I said, here's CICD and here's why you should use it, right? Which is a totally no. like, it still talks about the same stuff, but the focus yeah. is different. The focus is on the solution instead of the problem. Exactly. Exactly. So, and I always see like so much technology is a solution in search of a problem. And, and <laughs> it, I, I don't know where you fall in the whole AI debate, but I feel like all the hype about AI now is a solution in search of a problem. Like exactly. there are some problems that it solves, but it's yeah. always focused on the solution. Oh, AI is so wonderful. AI is so th well, what problem does it solve? Right? So let me tell you the, the biggest offender of this was actually NI. Uh, so remember how let's say compact real came out or let's say if a pxi something something came out or let's say a piece of hardware that came out guess what in austin they don't really know who the benefactor of this thing was like in the case of compact real you know you know why it didn't really sell well or as well as it should it was a brainchild of dr t who said hey why don't we put a, a stick of fpga in a plc that was rugged you know um, and perhaps they may have had customers in Austin who needed this ultra rugged thing with ultra, you know, computing power. Yep. But that was like a Ferrari of PLCs. Like, who are you going to sell? Who are you going to sell this to? Yeah, yeah, no. All the PLC people hated it because it's like a, it's super expensive. And exactly. like, exactly. Yeah. And the problem's already been solved for, for most things. Exactly. So yeah. then it becomes, uh, you know, in our position where we're selling this out in the branch, then people are like, why would I, why would I buy a five thousand dollar compact reel when I could do things with a hundred dollar? Well, I, I've been thing. walked into many situations where the person had talked to the NI salesperson first and bought a bunch of CRIOs, and I'm like, you could just do this with a PLC. Exactly. Like, why are you buying a CRIO? <laughs> oh, but it, but you could use Labby with it. <laughs> well, uh, there is some value to that, but not that much value. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So. Yeah. No, yeah. But, I mean, yeah. It's. You know. Uh, but this was Dr. T's company and he, he could do whatever the F he wanted. So, yeah. you know, uh, it, and a lot of times, so when you, when you get to those in a week conferences, keynotes and so forth, they bring out the latest and be best solutions, but they don't talk about what problems it solves. They, they talk about the prospect, you know, you, you, you could do this, you could do that with it, but they, they don't really actually define the problem that it solves. So that's that <laughs> looking back to my NI career, I was like, huh, which company was the worst at this? And I, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that a lot of the NI uh, keynotes and stuff felt like cheerleading. Yeah. So, but I, well, I, you know, that, that was start bringing customers on though. I do know there were some times when they brought customers on, but I'm trying to remember like yeah. what the focus of the conversation was on when they brought them on. Yeah. That, that was back in the day. So back in the day, it was more about product. Now, of course, you know, in the last few years, it's more about systems and solutions and so forth. So, so do you view um, the switch to the business unit thing in a good light from that way or no? Uh, no comment. Um, okay. Whatever. <laughs> I guess. I mean, with all due respect, um, I like for 
Yeah, I, I, I've gained enough, um, I, I should say, uh, I guess, maturity in business to know that that is the natural uh, next step of NI. Because, it, you know, it used to be kind of like the long tail business model where you had one of everything. But mm-hmm. that does, in and of, it, of itself, a billion, a billion dollar company cannot continue to grow and and do its thing without you know, cutting off some. some if you want to scale past that point. I, see, exactly. one of the questions I was asked though is, do all businesses need to scale? Because I think that's an interesting, because right, we live in this society where like everything should grow, 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 grow. And and I keep reading this social media post that says, you know, the only thing in nature that grows forever is cancer. Yeah. You know, so like, do, do we really need, like, can you, and, and that's actually a question, right? As somebody who runs their own business, like how yeah, big yeah. do you want to grow? Exactly. Can you reach a point where you're like, hey, I'm a million dollar a year business, $2 million a year, 10 million, whatever yeah. it is. And can so you just it, happy and say, I'm going to maintain this. Like, do I need to keep growing? It's easy if you're a, if you're a, um, if you own a hundred percent of the company. If because, you're a private company. Yeah. That's right, the problem. Right. like once you become a public company, then it's not what you want. It's what the shareholders want. Which yeah, is exactly. Important. So my, like my personal goal for tenant technologies is that I want to retire by, by the time I'm 50. I want to be financially free, I'm free of my time, and free of my worries, you know? Yeah. And so I'm going to spend the next, uh, I'm going to be 44, I guess, 43. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to be spending the next six or seven years building this thing so that I can sell it and cash out, ah. you know? That's my personal goal. See, I would like, my, my goal is I want to have the ability to walk away at that age and then... Exactly. Uh, have wait. the option. Yeah, because right. I, I don't see myself walking away. But if I got to a point where like any day I could wake up and be like, you know what, today's the day I'm going to sell it. Like, right. that's what I want. Right, right. And and with that in mind, then we have to flip around and think in terms of the buyer. You know, if like 10 years down the road, we do put our companies up for sale on the market. When the buyer looks at our, our company, our asset, they say, well, does it generate a stream of revenue? You know, does it yeah. does it acquire its own customers? And so what are you selling? Yeah. Well, that's actually a really good piece of advice for people who are starting their business. Because I know several people who are older and want to get out of their their businesses and they're doing consulting. Uh-huh. And, and they've sold themselves, which yeah. is like, hey, that that's great. Yeah. But you don't have a business to sell at the end of the day, because what are you going to sell me? Like yeah. someone would approach me and it's like, well, okay, I'll buy all your contacts, but like they all trust you, right? Are they going to so trust me, right? Exactly. And in yeah. that case, the the founder, the person, the, the 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 consultant, he's too attached to the company, so he can't sell unless he comes along with the sale. Yep. And right. And, and so that yeah, defeats, that defeats the whole purpose because you can't you can't deny you can't detach yourself from that. Because yeah. you're the asset that people want to buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you're doing the solo consulting thing, I mean, that's fine. But like, just know that you're not going to have anything to sell at the end. Right. And that might be a worthy goal in itself. You know, I'll do my own consulting thing for ten years, and then I'll I'll walk away and well, and that's you know, fine. you you could be a consultant and 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 write a you know kind of like a bible or a cookbook or something. You could transition. Yeah. You could retire and sell that book. Or yeah. sell classes. Or well, sell also, courses. you could bring other people on underneath you with the yeah. knowledge that, hey, you work with me for, like, that's what the one guy's doing. Like, you work with me for three or four years. Yeah. At the end of the time, they've all built relationships with you now, and now I can leave. Yeah. So it's kind of like a law firm, you know. Yeah. Uh, you, you enter as a junior, and then you you rise up as a as a, as a a partner. Yeah, well, also, I, I feel like having some sort of product, and I think in the lab world, it's hard to have products. Like soft, hardware products are a lot easier. Like what you got with Tenet, yeah. you, you sell actual hardware. For me, like software products are a lot harder to sell, particularly in the lab uh-huh. world. There's no, every, everybody writes their own, like I've got, I identify a problem, that's great. But everybody else has already identified that problem and solved it in their own way. Or they're smart enough to figure it out on their own. So why would they pay me? Right? That's well, kind of- sir, you know, I'm, 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 it's morning for me, but I'm looking for a cigar. <laughs> you know, it, I've actually had a, had a, had an idea because um, I see all these toolkits based on LabVIEW. You know, there's like the GPU toolkit and this toolkit and that toolkit mm-hmm. and that toolkit. You know, um, there, there are these uh, LabVIEW shops all around the world, you know, yours, you and yourself included, that may have been, that may have dabbled into uh, 
putting putting together toolkits or software products. Mm -hmm. But honestly, when when we come back to the to the point that I made, number one, if you build it, they will come. They will come. Question mark. And number <laughs> two, sell the problem, and not the solution. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of toolkits that sell the solution. <coughs> yeah. Meaning, you know, hey, we have this best GPU toolkit that allows you to use LabVIEW with uh, NVIDIA, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I um, saw that. Yeah, but my immediate question was, why do I need to use an NVIDIA? <laughs> and not the knock on it. Yeah, know. no. Yeah. But so here's my take. This is my business opportunity because I'm actually a marketer and a salesperson. So if you wrote your t toolkit with LabVIEW, I will come to you and I will write you a web page, like a landing page, you know, that focuses on what the problem this product solves. And the way we do it is if, if, if we can work out some sort of contract where if I'm the marketer for your product, mm -hmm. I take in sales, I get a cut of that, you know, like 10, 15, 20% or whatever. And you could sell to more people than you would have than just by yourself. Yeah. Uh, after this, you and I should talk because I, I, there's an idea. <laughs> we're done recording. I, I, we're going to have a conversation. Exactly. You cool. know. And so the third corollary of that is if you're trying to fish, don't think like a fisherman. Think like a fish. Yeah. Well, don't bait the hook with your favorite food. Right? Exactly. You don't go fishing with marshmallows and ham sandwiches. You go fishing with worms. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so let's say if I, if I was writing some copy for a LabVIEW toolkit, you know, the fish, the user is actually more focused on, okay, how easy is this thing going to be? What does it allow me to do? And so forth and so on. What not to do is I don't want to go into the speeds and feeds and the bells and whistles of what every feature this thing can do. I want to highlight which headaches this thing solves, which problem this thing solves, how much your life will be better with this toolkit, you know? And then if you're interested, leave your, leave your contact info and then we'll have somebody who'll reach out to you. And, and that's, so if you go on uh, that, <laughs> sh really shamefully, the website that I have for Tenet Technologies is really crude. It, it's like, pfft. <laughs> I did that in like half an hour. Well, I, have you looked at most LabVIEW consultants' websites? I, 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 I put myself up there with them. I, I look at them all the time, and I'm like, "This is kind of horrible." Well, yeah, I mean, well, I mean it's, it, 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 it's not from like me feeling better. It's actually I feel sad for them because I'm like, if you portrayed yourself in a better light, you would probably get more business. Well, yeah, yeah. So it, down, you know, I've been asked many questions. Does is it? Do I really have to spend ten thousand dollars for a really fancy website? I'm like, no. You have to define the problem that you want to solve for the customer and explain how you solve it. That's it. Well, I have, uh, you know. Yeah. What is it? Uh, good marketing helps bad products fail faster, or something, right? Yeah. So like, yeah. The key thing for the website is really the message more than anything. It's being concise and it's being clear. Like if I if I look at your website and in thirty seconds I can't tell what you do Boom, and what makes out. you different from any other company that any other LabVIEW consultant, then yeah. like yeah. yeah. I'm like the FPGA it, it, expert. I have 10 years, 20 years of experience. I can solve any FPGA problem you have. I don't give that a shit. Alone, if that was your front page for your website, you would do a lot better than 99% of consultants yeah. that I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, you connect the dots between your abilities to the customer's needs yeah. and problems. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's been, been the biggest sledgehammer, actually, you know, transitioning from an engineering mindset to, let's say, a business mindset, it was absolutely kind of 180. It, from an engineering mindset, you're focused on what you're building so much to the fact that you're oblivious to why you were building it in the first place. Yes. No, I think that's like the biggest thing. And that's why like, I'm all about the agile part of software development because if you're showing your customer your code every like week or two, you're talking to them constantly and you're trying yeah. to like to me, it's more focused on the customer. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's that's the the name of the game in the end of the day. It's all about the customer. That's oh. why, oh. you know, it frustrates me when you get into bigger companies with bigger bureaucracies and infrastructure and, 
everything, you know, it's like fill out this form. It just moves you things. further and further from the customer. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and if all this internal work was actually delivering value, more value to the customer, then great. I, I'd be, you know, ha, 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 agree with, agreeing with it 100%. But for a lot of bureaucracies, it's just like internal circles that, that turn mm -hmm. without delivering, you know, value to the customer. It's almost and, like they turn for their own benefit. <laughs> Exactly. And, and, you know, as a salesperson or, or, or as a marketing person, you say, okay, how does this internal turn? How can I, how can I sell that to the customer uh, and get more money from it? I'll give you a good example. Um, are you, do you know of the NISTS system? Semiconductor yes, uh, yes. No, uh, yeah. Uh... <laughs> okay, so from a scale of one to 10, here's John being, you know, really going, 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 going to be really politically correct. You know how that refrigerator, basically, and I just threw, you know, PXI chassis inside and, and made a system. For the sole reason, for the fact that other ATEs, they look like a, a refrigerator. Yeah. And, uh, and I didn't want to build one like, like from scratch. So they assembled these PXI chassis and gave the thing a, 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 a enclosure in the form of a automated t test equipment, AT, right? So I, let me give you a, a good example. As when we were selling these STSs internally, oh my God, there would be so many part numbers to manage because this entire, let's say this, this monolith, this was uh, assembled with this chassis, that chassis, that car, that car, that, 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 you know, different components and so forth. Every time we had to internally define this particular, let's say, so let's say if you're Apple, every time internally we had to define an STS system for Apple in order to sell this thing, we had to go through so many forms and processes and, and it was just so much internal churn just to just only to define the internal part number to sell this system you know and that has no that 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 doesn't take even take into account that all the technical work that went into building this thing so uh, another kind of redundancy was that to the customer this seemed like a a system that was ready to go off the bat mm -hmm. where internally uh it, it, there was so much layering of software drivers. There was like, so for PXI, you had the uh, PXI drivers and NI dash something something, NI dash something something. On top of that, and I made a, another software to unify everything as a system called the STS something manager or the STS software. Yeah. Uh, whenever something from a lower level driver that would be updated this whole thing would just kind of you have to test it and validate you had it. to roll up yeah yeah it, it was a mess it was a mess but you know people bought it uh it, it took a lot of engineering work and support work to make this thing not fall apart yeah but you know uh, the the business side of things kind of worked out i guess i would say the partner side of that was they took a bunch of work away from uh partners but oh yes the way yes, they tried to yes. sell it was oh you don't want to do this work anyway so we'll, we'll do it <laughs> no that and that was I true was not skeptical it, about i mean i wasn't doing that type of work so it didn't really dude affect me directly it, but. it is all for the better because if you're in integrated and if you wanted a piece of that pie let me tell you it was it it was not worth your time yeah, it, it was best to have and I handle it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Internally. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, also, like, I, I can kind of see that point of view in the sense that as an integrator, your best use of your time is solving the customer's problem back to the customer. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And building it and I and uh, the, the, the enclosure and all of that is not the best use of your time. Yeah. Right. If you can pick one off the shelf, then yeah. that's a better use of your time. So. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, big revelation. Um, it's funny because when when I go on customer visits, and uh, uh, let's say if a partner was with me or you know my my colleague was with me, um, 
the style of which I do presentations or communicate with the customer is very different from five years ago or 10 years ago. Now I don't, I don't do any demos anymore. None, none. I, I, I actually, if I sit down with the customer, previously it'll be like, okay, I open my laptop. Hey, look at all this cool stuff, blah, 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 blah. I can do this, I can do that, I can do this, I can do that. Um, nowadays, I just start with one sentence. Hi, I'm John Wu from Ted and Technologies. We do you know, motion control for LabVIEW, plus a few bunch of other things. What's the problem that you want to solve today? See, that, uh, so there's this thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I found an article about it, and maybe we'll throw it in the show notes, but uh, are you a waiter or a doctor, right? The yeah. waiter comes and shows you the menu that and says, order taker. these yeah. are the yeah. things that I can do. And, and A, you're limiting yourself, right? Yeah. And B, you're putting the effort on them to choose. They have to yeah. know what they want, right? Exactly. Versus if you're the doctor, you come in and you say, what are your symptoms? Yeah, or- and Almost they, always they, they know what the symptoms are, yeah. Yeah, they may not, or- even if they do not, what's, if they don't know what symptoms they are suffering from, you could even ask questions about, hey, does your head hurt when you wake up in the morning? Does yeah, you, you can, need, yeah. You know, if, if, if it does, if yes, then does your knee hurt when you uh, wake up at a certain time? Oh, okay. So, you know, research shows that when your head hurts and your knee hurts at the same time, you actually have a symptom called blah, blah, blah. Um, not many people suffer from, from it, but it can cause difficulties yeah. later on, you know, in well, life. luckily we have this pill called blah, blah, blah. If you take it, you know, the, this, uh, problem goes away. So, well, well, the other thing is though, too, is remembering that what they come to you with is usually the symptom and not the underlying problem. Exactly. Right? So it's that's, like if somebody comes and says, my arm hurts, right. oh, here's some Tylenol, go away. Well, if they broke their arm. Right? Like, why does their arm hurt? Does their arm hurt because they broke their arm? Does their arm hurt because they're having a heart attack? Right? Yeah. Those are two very different things that require very different yeah. responses. Exactly. Right? Often, so... we just like focus on like the thing that they come to us with. Oh, you have this problem. I know how to fix that. Exactly. Well, no, what's causing that? So my, my partners accuse me of being so lazy. You know, we go through all this trouble to arrange for a visit and we get on a train, you know, and we book the time with the customer and they're like, you walk in, you don't talk about our stuff at all. I'm like, dude, that's the point. Cause nobody cares about your stuff. They only yeah. care about their own problems. Yep. Yeah. Well that also builds trust, right? Cause, cause nobody, yeah. so, so uh, a business coach I used to talk to a lot, nobody wants to be sold anything, but everybody wants to buy something. Exactly. So right? I'm not a seller. I just, yeah. I just help you buy. <laughs> You're giving them the control. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I gather in the information for you to make the best buying decision that you can, you can make. No, I, and, I think that's great. So, uh, I could talk a lot longer. Do okay. you want to say like cool. an elevator pitch really quickly about, uh, tenant technologies and maybe your, uh, sure. yeah. Your one, other... one sentence, one liner, you know, tenant technologies were based in Taiwan. Um, uh, if you, uh, and I used to make motion controllers for LabVIEW, but they don't anymore. So technologies, we have a product that is a motion controller, hundred percent compatible with LabVIEW compared to other generic motion controllers. We guarantee compatibility with LabVIEW. We have a good API and that, that saves you time and money. So, because you don't have to do extra debugging or troubleshooting, or you don't have to get bounced around by, you know, support engineers from NI and these third parties, because we all know that's the vendor limbo <laughs> you hit the end of cycle of getting bounced around. You don't want that. Um, yeah. And so that's our elevator pitch. Um, you can go on our web on our website, uh, tenant dash motion.com. Um, um, if you want to, if your system needs to move a sensor around or if it needs to move a dot, you know, a device under test around, um, something having to do with the physical world, check us out. Cool. And then you also have the NI parts direct. Like a yeah. So that's a, that's a side project. So during the pandemic, you know, people were asking me, Hey, do you have this DAC board? Do you have that DAC board? I'm like, I, dude, I don't sell NI hardware, but I know of some people who might have them. So we actually started out, um, this actually was with Kurt Friday, uh, in, uh, Australia. Okay, yeah. so we have a, we have a LinkedIn group called, uh, uh, NI trading post. Yep. Uh, yeah. And you might be in it. You, uh, I think it's private for right now, but we might make, make it public. The initial thought was for people 
if you had NI hardware just sitting around doing nothing, you could put it up there for people to borrow uh, and you could be the loaner. Um, that was the original deal because it was, it was, it was kind of trying to get, make a shared pool of resources, of hardware resources, kind of like a library. Well, the logistics of that, you know, however goodwilled it was, um, you can imagine if I if I if I put a five dollar screwdriver up for loan, uh, and if I don't get it back, that's not going to matter too much. If I put up a five thousand psi system up for loan and I don't get it back from a random person on the internet, that's going to cause problems. So um, it eventually evolved into kind of like a buy sell trade forum. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of kind of getting people yeah, like if you have. A DAC board gathering dust in your house. Put it up for sale on on on, on this forum, you know. Um, but there there wasn't too much traction. But then on the flip side, people actually started DMing me and messaging me. Hey, dude, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this? Do you have that? I'm like, I know, but I I know somebody who who does. So it became kind of rolled into a, a parts finding service, uh, and and I Parts Direct uh, is kind of an extension that of that where we stock. Um, some of the more popular items, you know, like DAC boards, uh, USB stuff, uh, GPIB, um, some PXI, and so forth. Um, but yeah, like how Tenet started out, because, and I cut off motion, and that's been cutting off a lot of things in the portfolio. <laughs> exactly. If you have test systems based on those things, and they don't give you a good migration path, they don't have a good solution, you know, for you to follow up on. Um, as opposed to going on eBay or Taobao and get, getting a rock in your mailbox, uh, you don't know, you don't know how well these vendors can be trusted. You might as well, you know, go on nrpartsdirect.com or message me and say, "Hey, do you have this thing? And do you have that thing?" Because we test everything that that we ship beforehand to make sure that it's okay and well and good. Uh, that might sound simple, but it's actually quite nuanced because of how NI products are structured. It's not like there's a power button here and you just press on, you see a light, okay, good, ship. No, no, because for every board, you have to install this driver and that driver. You have to make sure, you know, there's a uh, proper connector, proper connection, um, because it's a component, right? It's, it's not just a toaster or a TV that you could just press on and say, hey, it works. Um, so that's, that's kind of the elevator pitch for that. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Sam. And, you know, I, I hope to see more episodes from other people on the podcast. And also, you know, you got this unconference. Is that the same thing as the one in December about business or those? Yeah, the unconference is the uh, Lab U Consultants thing. But I would uh, love to see us do more on conferences because I think it's a great idea where you bring your problems and your ideas yeah. and things that you want to talk about as opposed yeah, yeah. to going to a conference where basically you're just fed whatever the people who who are presenting want to talk yeah. about it's more interactive so so you know mark my words if you build it they will not come number two sell the solution not uh, sell the problem not the solution and number three if you want to fish think like a fish not like a fisherman great yes. awesome those are the cool. key takeaways <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's it for today's episode of the LabVIEW Experiment. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or questions, head over to thelabviewexperiment.com and drop me a note. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the LV Experiment.